just when you think the world couldn't possibly get any stranger than it is right now, this happens. And nobody seems to be talking about it. Let's talk about the next wave of robotics, the next wave of AI, robotics, physical AI. So far, all of the AI that we've talked about is one computer. Data comes into one computer. We take all of the data, we put it into a system like DGX, we compress it into a large language model. Trillions of tokens becomes billions of parameters. These billions of parameters becomes your AI. So I just described in very simple terms essentially what just happened in large language models, except the chat GPT moment for robotics may be right around the corner. And so we've been building the end-to-end -end systems for robotics for some time. I'm super, super proud of the work. We have the AI system, DGX. We have the lower system, which is called AGX, for autonomous systems. The world's first robotics processor. When we first built this thing, people are, what are you guys building? It's an SOC, it's one chip, it's designed to be very low power, but it's designed for high-speed sensor processing and AI. Things are getting crazy out there, Fanny. Maybe they were right. They were right. They were right. I can't believe it. It's actually happening. It's actually happening. I can't believe it. It's actually happening. I guess I'm just not used to being chased around a mall in the middle of the night by killer robots. All right, let's dive a little bit deeper into this world of artificial intelligence and the machinery that's behind it. Let's think of AI as this ultra smart robot brain. It's learning at crazy speeds and tackling stuff we once thought only the human brain could tackle. You name it, AI is doing it. But here's the catch. The smarter these robot brains get, the blurrier the line between controlling them and being controlled by them becomes. Now, onto the hardware. The actual metal and microchips in these AI brains live in what we call GPUs, which traditionally have been used for video games. However, currently, GPUs or graphics processing units is what is used to train AI. And the leading company making these GPUs is NVIDIA. Have you heard of Moore's Law, which says technology gets twice as good every two years or so. But as these machines get stronger, historically, we've always feared what we can't control. Take Oppenheimer's reflection on creating the atomic bomb. He said, quote, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And that fits perfectly with what's happening in the world of artificial intelligence. What you're about to watch is a presentation by the CEO of NVIDIA, who makes all of the GPUs that power all the AI on the earth. And what he reveals in this presentation shows just how far we've gone in the past few years. The rate at which we're advancing computing is insane. Over the course of the last eight years, we've increased computation by 1,000 times. Eight years, 1,000 times. Remember, back in the good old days of Moore's Law, it was 10x every five years, 100 times every 10 years, in the middle of the PC revolution. 100 times every 10 years. In the last eight years, we've gone 1,000 times. We have two more years to go. The rate at which we're advancing computing is insane. And it's still not fast enough, so we built another chip. This is the most advanced GPU in the world in production today. This is Hopper. This is Hopper. Hopper changed the world. This is Blackwell. 208 billion transistors. And so, so you could see, you, it, it, I can see, there, there's a small line between two dies. This is the first time two dies have abutted like this together in such a way that the two, chip, the two dies think it's one chip. There's 10 terabytes of data between it, 10 terabytes per second, so that these two, these two sides of the Blackwell chip have no clue which side they're on. There's no memory locality issues, no cache issues. It's just one giant chip. When we were told that Blackwell's ambitions were beyond the limits of physics, uh, the engineer said, so what? And so this is what happened. And so this is the Blackwell chip, and it goes into two types of systems. The first one is form-fit function compatible to Hopper. And so you slide on Hopper and you push in Blackwell. That's the reason why one of the challenges of ramping is going to be so efficient. There are installations of hoppers all over the world, and the same infrastructure, same design, the power, the electricity, the thermals, the software, identical, push it right back. 
And so this is a hopper version for the current HGX configuration. The second hopper looks like this. Now this is a prototype board, and this is a fully functioning board, and I'll, I'll just be careful here. This right here is, I don't know, $10 billion. <laughs> the second one's five. It gets cheaper after that, so the way it's going to go to production is like this one here. Two Blackwell chips and four Blackwell dies connected to a Grace CPU. The Grace CPU has a super fast chip-to-chip -chip link. What's amazing is this computer is the first of its kind where this much computation fits into this small of a place, but we need a whole lot of new features in order to push the limits beyond, if you will, the limits of physics. And so one of the things that we did was we invented another transformer engine. And so this new transformer engine, we have a fifth generation NVLink. It's now twice as fast as Hopper, but very importantly, it has computation in the network. And the reason for that is because when you have so many different GPUs working together, we have to share our information with each other. We have to synchronize and update each other. Having extraordinarily fast links and being able to do mathematics right in the network allows us to essentially amplify even further. So even though it's 1.8 terabytes per second, it's effectively higher than that. And so it's many times that of Hopper. Overall, compared to Hopper, it is two and a half times the FP8 performance for training per chip. It also has this new format called FP6, so that even though the computation speed is the same, the amount of parameters you can store in the memory is now amplified. FP4 effectively doubles the throughput. This is vitally important for inference. The amount of energy we save, the amount of networking bandwidth we save, the amount of waste of time we save will be tremendous. The future is generative, which is the reason why we call it generative AI, which is the reason why this is a brand new industry. The way we compute is fundamentally different. We created a processor for the generative AI era, and one of the most important parts of it is content token generation. We call it, this format is FP4. That's a lot of computation. 5x the token generation, 5x the inference capability of Hopper seems like enough. But why stop there? And so we would like to have a bigger GPU, even bigger than this one. And so we decided to scale it. So we built another chip. This chip is just an incredible chip. We call it the NVLink switch. It's 50 billion transistors. It's almost the size of Hopper all by itself. This switch chip has four NVLinks in it each 1.8 terabytes per second. What is this chip for? If we were to build such a chip, we can have every single GPU talk to every other GPU at full speed at the same time. That's insane. And as a result, you can build a system that looks like this. This is what a DGX looks like now. Remember, just six years ago, I delivered the uh, first DGX1 to OpenAI. That DGX, by the way, was 170 teraflops. That's 0.17 petaflops. So this is 720. And so this is now 720 petaflops, almost an exaflop for training, and the world's first one exaflops machine in one rack. Just so you know, there are only a couple, two, three exaflops machines on the planet as we speak. And so this is an exaflops AI system in one single rack. Well, let's take a look at the back of it. So this is what makes it possible. That's the back, that's the, that's the back, the DGX MV link spine. 130 terabytes per second goes through the back of that chassis. That is more than the aggregate bandwidth of the internet. We could basically send everything to everybody within a second. Let's talk about the next wave of robotics, the next wave of AI, robotics, physical AI. 
So far, all of the AI that we've talked about is one computer. Data comes into one computer. We take all of the data, we put it into a system like DGX, we compress it into a large language model. Trillions of tokens becomes billions of parameters. These billions of parameters becomes your AI. So I just described in very simple terms essentially what just happened in large language models, except the chat GPT moment for robotics may be right around the corner. And so we've been building the end-to-end -end systems for robotics for some time. I'm super, super proud of the work. We have the AI system, DGX. We have the lower system, which is called AGX, for autonomous systems, the world's first robotics processor. When we first built this thing, people are, what are you guys building? It's an SOC, it's one chip, it's designed to be very low power, but it's designed for high-speed sensor processing and AI. And so if you want to run transformers in a car or anything um, that moves, uh, we have the perfect computer for you. It's called the Jetson. And so the DGX on top for training the AI, the Jetson is the autonomous processor, and in the middle, we need another computer. We need a simulation engine that represents the world digitally for the robot, so that the robot has a gym to go learn how to be a robot. We call that virtual world Omniverse. And the computer that runs Omniverse is called OVX. And OVX, the computer itself, is hosted in the Azure cloud. Okay? And so basically, we built these three things, these three systems. On top of it, we have algorithms for every single one. Now, I'm going to show you one super example of how AI and Omniverse are going to work together. The example I'm going to show you is kind of insane, but it's going to be very, very close to tomorrow. It's a robotics building. This robotics building is called a warehouse. Inside the robotics building are going to be some autonomous systems. Some of the autonomous systems are going to be called humans, and some of the autonomous systems are going to be called forklifts. And these autonomous systems are going to interact with each other, of course, autonomously, and it's going to be overlooked upon by this warehouse to keep everybody out of harm's way. The warehouse is essentially an air traffic controller. And whenever it sees something happening, it will redirect traffic and give new waypoints, just new waypoints to the robots and the people, and they'll know exactly what to do. This warehouse, this building, you can also talk to. Of course you could talk to it. Hey, and all of this is running in real time. What about all the robots? All of those robots you were seeing just now, they're all running their own autonomous robotic stack. Let's talk about robotics. Everything that moves will be robotic. There's no question about that. It's safer, it's more convenient, and one of the largest industries is going to be automotive. Beginning of next year, we will be shipping in Mercedes, and then shortly after that, JLR. Today, we're announcing that BYD, the world's largest EV company, is adopting our next generation. It's called Thor. Thor is designed for transformer engines. Thor, our next generation AV computer, will be used by BYD. The next generation of robotics will likely be a humanoid robotics. We now have the necessary technology to imagine generalized human robotics. In a way, human robotics is likely easier, and the reason for that is because we have a lot more training data that we can provide the robots, because we are constructed in a very similar way. It could be in video form, it could be in virtual reality form. We then created a gym for it called Isaac Reinforcement Learning Gym, which allows the humanoid robot to learn how to adapt to the physical world. And then an incredible computer, the same computer that's going to go into a robotic car, this computer will run inside a humanoid robot called Thor. It's designed for transformer engines. The soul of NVIDIA, the intersection of computer graphics, physics, artificial intelligence. It all came to bear at this moment. The name of that project, General Robotics Zero, zero, three. I know. Super good. <laughs> Super good. Well, I think we have some special guests. Do we? <laughs> hey, guys. So I understand you guys are powered by Jetson. They're powered by Jetsons. Little Jetson robotics computers inside. They learn to walk 
in Isaac Sim. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this, this is orange, and this is the famous green. They are the BDX robots of Disney. Amazing Disney research. Come on, you guys, let's wrap up. Let's go. Five things. Where are you going? What are you saying? No, it's not time to eat. It's not time to eat. I'll give, I'll give you a snack in a moment. Let me finish up real quick. First, a new industrial revolution. Every data center should be accelerated. A trillion dollars worth of installed data centers will become modernized over the next several years. Second, the computer of this revolution, the computer of this generation, generative AI, trillion parameters, this is what we announced to you today. This is Blackwell. Amazing, amazing processors, NVLink switches, networking systems, and the system design is a miracle. This is Blackwell, and this to me is what a GPU looks like in my mind. Everything that moves in the future will be robotic. You're not going to be the only one. And these robotic systems, whether they are humanoid, AMRs, self-driving cars, forklifts, manipulating arms, they will all need one thing. Giant stadiums, warehouses, factories. There can be factories that are robotic, manufacturing lines that are robotics, building cars that are robotics. These systems all need one thing. They need a platform, a digital platform, a digital twin platform, and we call that Omniverse, the operating system of the robotics world. Well, first you had robots, then you had self-replicating robots. There's a growing fear that robots will continue to make the human workforce obsolete. Before the success of the ubiquitous human-sized police robots, there was a bigger bad boy on the block, the moose. We are able to give robots superficial responses which mimic human expression. I saw something incredible. I saw three robots totally reprogrammed in 10 minutes. We created a race of robots. A race of robots. So there it is. Proof that things are changing more rapidly than most people can possibly imagine. Then there's the question of what comes next in all this. Aristotle once said, knowing yourself is the beginning of wisdom. But if AI can think, decide, and maybe one day understand itself better than we do, where does that leave us? Now, let's forget about all the gadgets and gizmos powered by AI for a second and focus on what's about to happen. As we speak, they are implanting AI into actual robots and they're building these things right now with plans to be unleashed on humanity within a few years. This is not science fiction anymore. Just think, what's a few years ago? 2021. That was three years ago. In that same time period forward, we're going to see robots. We are building a world where AI might decide everything, from who might get a loan to who's fit to raise a child, even who's guilty of a crime. It's like opening Pandora's box, which, once opened, can't be closed again. But what do you think about this? I want to hear your opinion. Please put your opinion in the comment section if you haven't done so already. And don't forget to hit that like button. And until next time, thank you for watching and God bless you all.